Devils and Demons, this is Nurse Hatchet, She-Wolf of the Wolf Pack. The horror genre is a great expanse. Let us explore it. I've spent years as a podcaster building my reputation, interviewing people in horror, and discussing both films and literary horror. Join the exploration and let us celebrate the horror genre. I'm William Pattison. And this is Bloodbath Beyond Podcast. Testing, testing, testing the microphone, like a little goblin. <laughs> oh, God, save me. Thank you, horror hippie, for keeping that in my head. Oh, God, save me. Goran scares everybody. Well, welcome to the season premiere of Bloodbath Beyond podcast. 
I'm your host, William Pattison, King of Splatterpunk, and author of the Cam Crystal Lake novels. Yep, it's been a couple of months, you know. I had I always put a hiatus on a podcast. Uh you know, I might might throw in a couple of interviews uh during the hiatus, but you know, on uh an awakening of horror, but uh, for the most part, my main podcasts are always uh, on hiatus at this time. Anyways, all right. Well, we got a good show for you tonight. Uh, this is a long time coming uh, subject. Uh, you know, one that I absolutely love. Uh, tonight, we are going to be discussing the 1989 version of Phantom of the Opera, you know, the one with uh, Robert England. So that's going to be good. But... Before that, of course, you know, it's a new year, and I've got to have my new beginning of the year ranting time. Yes! If you don't want to hear the rant, then jump forward to the beginning of the discussion. You know, but some people might actually find this interesting because I got some good shit this time. Yeah, literally do. It's going to be wonderful. All righty, so let's uh, get on the hell gondola and go to Clown World. Oh, boy. I know you're overwhelmed with joy. Anyways, alrighty. So, amusingly enough, it's the time of the year where the LGBTQ community puts out, well, LGBTQ community uh, organization, GLAD. Yeah, G L A A D. Yeah, uh, they rate entertainment uh, for the LGBTQ community. Yeah, they're the reason why we have all this woke crap. Because Disney and all the other uh, things seem to think that this is important. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so GLAD put out their report and graded, graded the, um, uh, you know, streaming companies. They rated the studios, everything. And amusingly enough, woke and LGBTQs. But, buddy, Disney got an F rating. The reason why is according to GLAD. I can't believe this. Uh, they said that only 28% of their, uh, fil you know, their films were... L had LGBTQ characters and that and presented in the way that they prefer them. Wow. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. Another bunch that got, uh, got bad ratings is Warner Brothers and... Believe it or not, Netflix. What the fuck? Netflix? 
<laughs> yeah, here it is. You know, all these companies are sitting there losing money, losing billions of dollars to try to pacify these jackasses. And what do they get for all their work? Oh, no, you're not good enough. You're only 28%. Oh, God. You know, I mean, seriously. You know, what, what Disney and them should be thinking about is paying customers rather than blue and pink-haired nutcases. But whatever. Anyways, so, yeah. Yeah, that's what they get. For, for all their work fucking over uh, paying customers for, uh, sm you know, small groups and that. Yeah, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what they get. And you know what? You know, it's like comic books, yeah. Uh, comic books also got, got a bad rating, too. Through the GLAD report. Give me a fucking break. Yeah, supposedly, uh, GLAD is not going to be happy unless it's 50% uh, LGBTQ uh, uh, inclusion. Yeah, well, you're not going to get it. Sorry, GLAD. Anyways, alrighty, so let's get back into more interesting little clown world. You know, here I here I talked about how uh, the comic book industry is fucked up because of LGBTQ, uh, uh, the infection of LGBTQ and uh, infection of uh, of woke. Yeah. Well, I'm not calling uh, LGBTQ people that I'm considering the nutcases in the comic book industry that is fucking everything up. So don't get after me, uh, LGBTQ people. I'm not. I'm not insulting you. You know, I have a lot of friends who are LGBTQ, and uh, no. No, it's just uh, these radical nutcases that just, uh, God. Well, anyways, oh, you're going to love this. You are going to fucking love this. Oh, yeah. So, if you haven't already heard, uh, Joker has had... A baby! There's a little baby Joker, yeah. Uh, the thing is that Joker gave birth to this baby. Yeah, Joker Jr., uh, well, at least that's what we're called, baby Joker or whatever. Yeah, uh, Joker got pregnant, he got the big belly and stuff, oh, God save me from that shit. <laughs> but anyways, um, thing is that uh, John Constantine's old girlfriend, Zatanna, uh, put a curse on Joker so that he could never get a woman pregnant. Well, her spell backfired and all of a sudden Joker is pregnant. He's got the big belly and everything and he gives birth to a baby. Well, you know, the doctor that was at the birth, he's going, I, you know, I literally don't know how he's going to give, give birth. Oh God, you're going to love this people. You are absolutely going to love this. Uh, he pooped the baby out. It was a poop baby. It comes it came out as shit. And then morphed into a baby. Seriously, it came out of his butthole. People, fucking amazing. So anyways, yeah, dear old Joker, he 
he goes and presents the baby to Zatanna. He he and he's like, Oh look, Zatanna! We got a little baby! Little baby joker! <laughs> Oh, my fucking God. Save me. Ah, uh, God, the comic book industry is fucking going to hell. Please save me. Ah, uh, God. I mean, seriously. I mean, you, you, you look at Marvel. Marvel is already putrefying and maggoty and shit. It, you know... They're 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 already dead and they don't know it. Uh, DC, the only comic book that DC is making money off of right now is Batman. But the thing is that DC has you're gonna you're you're gonna be blown away, people. Thirty. Batman comics in circulation right now. 30 fucking Batman comics. Un-fucking believable. But yeah, he's the only superhero that is making any money in the comics from, of DC. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. It, it, it is fucked. You know... You know, seriously, it's going to be the independents that are going to keep the comic book uh, uh, art form going. You know, people like uh, Eric July and that, because <sighs> seriously, Marvel and DC, they are fucked. They're completely fucked in the head, the writers there. These people are just, they're criminal. Let's put it that way. They are criminal in how they fucked everything up. Thank God I kind of gave up, uh, you know, reading comic books in the late 90s. Uh, now, pretty much the only thing I'm reading is I'm going back over uh, Hellblazer. You know, it, that gives me joy, but I will not touch any of these new comic books. Uh, I found out this thing about the Joker from a friend, and he showed me he showed me the artwork for this poop fest. Oh my God, the artwork on this is gross. I mean, seriously, it is fucking nasty. So anyways, yeah, so that's that's what I have to say, you know. Um, you know, I'm kind of thankful that uh, Woke hasn't really hit that bad in uh, horror. You know, horror movie wise, um, you know, I mean, yes, you had bodies, bodies, bodies. You had they, them, and that, but uh, not too, not too much. And and you know, they pretty much. Those got got pretty much ignored. I I I watched them, um, you know, just because I'm a reviewer and just uh fuck. You know, one nice thing about this year, you know, well last year I should say 2022 was they came out with so many wonderful and fantastic horror films. Seriously, I was incredibly impressed with the quality of the horror films last year. Uh, I even, I even, uh, just recently, I actually watched uh, The Invitation. 
And, you know, that people kept saying, oh, yeah, that's a woke film. That's a woke film. I didn't notice the wokeness of it. I thought that it was just a fantastic vampire film. I liked how they handled it. It reminded me of Ready or Not or Knives Out and the old film The Legacy. I thought those were, it was great. I, I loved it. So, yeah, you know, that's, that, you know, the invitation is the best way to do a woke film. Um, they, them, fucking hated it, you know? They tried to do a woke, uh, slasher well you know slasher film but because it is woke they couldn't have them killing the lgbq campers it had to be the camp counselors who were being killed okay whatever uh you know personally i think the best gay uh, slasher film was uh, Hellbent. I actually went and saw that when it came out. Uh, my sister and I found out that it was playing at this uh, one theater in San Jose, and we made a special trip to go see it. And I was actually impressed by that. You know, it's a shame that you pretty much don't hear anything about Hellbent anymore because that was, it was not only a good gay uh, slasher film, it was a good slasher film. It had all the tropes that we like with uh, slasher films, and it was just pretty damn cool, you know. Yeah, if you you know, I'm I'm waiting for Scream Factory to get their hands on it and give us a 4K uh, uh, remaster on that. You know, definitely if you get a chance, check it out. Uh, it's very hard to find. I've been trying to find a copy of it for years and haven't been able to find one. So. Anyway, so that is the end of my rant. And now it is time for me to start our main conversation, which I'm absolutely proud to do because uh, it is Phantom of the Opera. And it's, you know, I love Phantom of the Opera. You know, I've seen pretty much every rendition of Phantom of the Opera. You know, I've seen Phantom of the Paradise. I've seen Phantom of the uh, Shopping Mall. I've seen all of them. I even saw Dario Argento's, oh, God, uh, Phantom of the Opera, which just, oh, God, save me. But anyways, yeah, you know, it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, planning a season season premiere uh i'll do phantom of the opera and i'll do phantom of the opera 1989 which is a very interesting uh rendition of phantom of the opera you know because it was 1989 and you had Robert England playing Eric Dessler, the Phantom of the Opera. Now, that's a thing. Freddy Krueger playing the Phantom of the Opera. And I was, I was, you know, the moment I heard about this film, I was intrigued about it. You know, because I, you know, because I've seen the old black and white, uh, you know, silent film. 
I saw the one with Herbert Lom. I've seen pretty much all of all of the different versions. You know, I even saw the uh, television uh, miniseries that came out pretty much the same time as this uh, movie, about 89. Uh, and they had the uh, guy that played the principal in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he was playing the Phantom in it, and you got to hear him sing. Um, anyways, um, you know, if, you know, if you don't know the history of Phantom of the Opera, uh, it's based on a book by Gaston Lennox. You know, I've, I've actually got two copies of Phantom of the Opera. I've got one that is a leather-bound uh, edition. And I've got another one that was just this beautifully painted version of it. Just beautiful. The paintings on it were just magnificent. Um, interesting little piece of information. Um, it what what's funny about Phantom of the Opera, the book, is that the Phantom is not romantically interested in the opera singer Christine Dea. Day. Well, it's Christine Day in this ver version of it, but sometimes they say Dea. But anyways, uh, no. Uh, in the actual book, Eric... You know, he, he only he only goes by the name Eric, you know, the Phantom Phantom. Um he is in fact obsessed with the opera house. Christine is just a way to uh, to a means. Because the thing is that um as the story opens, the opera house is being, uh, you know, they it's got new owners. And these owners are not showing Eric the proper respect. See, Eric feels that he is the owner, the ruler of the opera house. You know, he's, he's the ruler of the catacombs beneath the opera house. You know, he's like, you know, this big king underneath there and stuff. And the former owners of the opera house would give him a certain amount of the take from the operas, and they gave him a special uh, seat in the opera so that you know the the phantom's booth basically but the new uh owners refused that and so eric who is this evil you know mastermind you know yes he did you know like like in in all the other versions, he is a composer and he is writing his, his opera, which he thinks is going to be the ultimate opera, Don Juan Triumphant. But, you know, as I said, uh, there's he's not obsessed with uh, Christine in the actual book. But uh, for some reason, Hollywood decided that they had to make uh, Phantom of the Opera this twisted uh, romance between Christine and the Phantom. And he was obsessed with Christine and her voice. And, you know, 
because he's he's training her and that, and he brings her down to his secret lair to train her and, you know, send her back to the, the and all that. And of course, you know, it, you know, as you know, uh, in the, uh, sequel to the, uh, musical Phantom of the Opera, uh, Christine and him had had sex and she had a son by the Phantom of the Opera. Oh, I love Love Never Dies. That That's a really good uh, musical. I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's very good. Anyway, so back to uh, 1989, Robert England, Phantom of the Opera. One thing I do have to praise about this film is that the filmmakers, uh, they had to have been Hammer film uh, fans because this film feels a lot like the Hammer rendition of Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very bloody, it's very dark, you know, and they just do so well uh, doing uh, doing the piece on this. Um, in this version, they add a little bit of a supernatural aspect to this. Uh, the thing is that the Phantom is cursed. He, he used to be a normal man. He was composer Eric Dessler, and indeed he was writing his uh, opera, Don Juan Triumphant, and he wanted his music to live on. He wanted his uh, music to be eternal. So what ends up happening is Eric uh, makes a deal with the devil. I don't know if it's the devil or if it's just a crossroads demon, but anyways, um, Eric makes a deal with uh, this demon, and the demon says, yes, you're... Music will be eternal, and so will you. As long as your music stays and is in the world, you will live as well. But you will not be a person that people will want to look upon. And he goes and he takes his hands and he destroys Eric Dessler's face. He burns his face with his hands. They had a wonderful uh, midget guy playing the devil in this. He was he did very good. So anyway, so Eric's face is destroyed. He's immortal. He is connected to his music. So his music has to live on, and he has to live on through that. And so Eric figures out a way to be able to be out in the world. You know, he's, he's a theater person. So what he does is he kills people, and he harvests their skin, and he makes, he rebuilds his face with their skin. He literally sews pieces of skin to his face. It is one of the more shocking uh, parts of the movie, 
is where he's where he's taking the skin off because of course the skin is going to start to rot and so he has to get new skin but anyways yeah he he uh he uses the skin and then he uses makeup to cover it he gives himself a uh, a new a new chin because the demon destroyed his chin and destroyed his nose so he has to has to rebuild his nose as well the results are interesting there you know he's got this long chin and he's got this nose and that and he looks pale and that but anyways yeah you know he he in this version he's able to walk around in the city he's able to go to the pubs and stuff and it's interesting because in one scene he also he goes to the brothel and he picks uh, a dark-haired uh, uh, prostitute, and he forces her to spend the night with him, and he tells her, uh, tonight your name is Christine. She goes, she goes, but my name's Lily. And he goes, tonight your name is Christine. And so anyways, yeah, so this, this, um, Phantom is, of course, obsessed with Christine Day. Uh, she is, uh, a young, uh, opera singer. She's, she's trying to make her way through. Um, the Phantom makes, you know, gives her an opportunity of a lifetime because he scares off the head female singer in the opera, uh, El Carlata. Yeah, he scares her to death, you know, to the point where she can't sing. And so Christine gets to gets to play in it the the play that they're pl they're doing is faust so she gets to play the lead in faust the female lead anyways she thinks that eric is this angel that was being sent by her father to help her out and to teach her how to sing. You know, she doesn't know what Eric is planning. Eric is planning on marrying her in a black magic ritual and connecting her to the music, his music, and, you know, having her forever be his companion. Uh, interesting piece of uh, information on this is that this film starts out in modern times and Christine Day is alive at that time she you know she's living a no new life she's also a you know wants to be an opera singer and what happens is a friend of hers finds an old rare bookshop and Christine finds Eric Dessler's uh opera you know, unfinished opera, Don Juan Triumphant. And 
she decides to use that, you know, for her audition. And what happens is she goes to the audition and a light nearly falls on her. She hits the floor and is knocked out and immediately transported into the past. You know, late 1800s at the London Opera. It, that's, that's another interesting piece of trivia is that in this version, it is the London Opera, whereas in the original Phantom of the Opera and most of the adaptations, it is the Paris Opera, thus giving reason for the catacombs underneath the opera house. Because as as people are aware, you know, Paris is loaded with catacombs. I don't think London has any catacombs. Not sure, but I don't think the London Opera has catacombs. So it doesn't quite mesh right. It's one of the weaknesses of this film. But the thing is that they brought in a lot of English actors to be in this. So, you know, and the English accents sound a lot better than trying to do French accents. So, you know, that was pretty good. You know, it's, it's good, but it's, it's not accurate to the source material. But the thing is with this film it's not accurate to the to the source material really at all. Uh, this film is very much very bloody. I mean, you're you're seeing uh, Eric Dessler kill people. I mean, he kills uh, one of the people that you know does does the lighting and stuff uh, because he because of the fact that he almost. Uh, kills Christine, you know, a light falls and nearly hits her. So Eric goes and uh, butchers him and leaves him in El Carlata's uh, wardrobe. <laughs> ah, yeah, she finds, she goes, goes to change her clothes and there it is, all skinned. Uh, he he also in a later part of the film he kills a critic that El Carlotta and a few people have paid off to you know give a bad review to Christine's performance in Faust and yeah uh, he butchers him. So anyways, yeah, so uh, in the film, uh, Christine also has uh, a budding relationship with uh, one of the uh, ones that owns the, the opera. You know, this young man who, who's also uh, an owner in the opera and... So, yeah, uh, it makes Eric uh, uh, very jealous in that. And at one point, uh, he decides that, he, you know, she has betrayed him. This is after he's uh, put the ring on her finger and married her to the music. So, yeah, uh, she is already cursed at this point. She's going to live from life to life, uh, you know, reliving everything that happened uh, through the ages. And so anyways, yeah, he brings her down. He... he he well, the thing is, it happens during 
uh, the big uh, uh, masquerade thing. You know, the the theater has a masquerade party every year, and Eric showed up as the Red Death, you know, complete with skull mask and that, you know, which is a tradition in Phantom of the Opera. I mean, it's even in the book, the Mask of the Red Death scene. And in uh, the black and white film version, it is actually the only scene that is done in color. They actually, at that point, because this was such an important scene, they did it in color. So if you can find a copy of the original Lon Chaney uh, Phantom of the Opera where they have the Mask of the Red Death scene in color, you got yourself a good copy because it's incredibly hard to find now. Uh, I think they did, you know, for the uh, DVD copy, I think they uh, colorized it. But uh, the original uh, old-fashioned colorization was incredible for that film. Anyway, so yeah, so he, um, he shows up. Uh, he ends up, he kills Carlotta. Yeah, because Carlotta's there, and he drags her over to the side, and she's thinking that he that he wants to, uh, you know, that he's some kind of influential man, and that, you know, he's he's flirting with her, and she's going, he's going, uh, oh, you want to see the face underneath? And she goes, well, what am I going to think when I see it? And he says, oh, you'll just die. And literally he does, he kills her. Anyway, so what ends up happening is he, is he captures, uh, you know, Christine, takes her down to his, uh, his, uh, place again. Uh, the police and the young man that she's in love with, uh, they go down into the, uh, into the catacombs and, uh, Eric goes around and kills off the cops. And then he ends up, uh, killing, uh, Christine's uh, boyfriend, and Christine goes and starts his uh, lair on fire, and Christine ends up, she gets knocked back into the present. Uh, she's introduced to the man that is uh, running the opera, and he hires her. Uh, he's, of course, played by Robert England. You know, looks totally normal. And, you know, that. So he invites her to his place. He has an apartment for drinks and to celebrate. And... You know, she goes there and he sees in the window that he has a little bit of a issue there. So he goes into his room and in his room, there's all these faces, you know, Robert <laughs> England faces. And supposedly, yeah, it's, it's the Phantom and he's found a way to make realistic faces you know, so he doesn't have to kill people anymore. And he can just pull one off and put the new one on, and it's all great and that. Well, while he's in his room, 
fixing his face. Uh, Christine uh, checks out his composing computer that he has. And she sees that on the computer is Don Juan Triumphant and realizes that this is the Phantom. And she's like, oh my God. And she accidentally hits a button and it starts playing and popping out copies of the music. And so anyways, she gets it to stop. He comes around and she goes, oh my God, it's you and that. And he's like, yes. He goes, don't you remember you wed the music? You are part of the music now. You and I are together forever. And she goes and rips his face off. And he's got this horrible, you know, his, his face is rotting underneath the mask. I guess I guess uh, the the demon didn't uh, include the fact that uh, he's um, you know he would uh, still you know his wounds would be fine but yeah uh, his his face is just horrible and he's sitting there and he's coughing <coughs> yes you had that. The music and all this, you know, it's forever. It's forever, Christine, as long as the music is. So she starts his music on fire, and he is just screaming in pain. And she runs out of his apartment, and she's on the street you know, just getting over this, oh my God, you know, what's happening? And then all of a sudden, behind her, there's this guy and he's playing a violin and he's playing Don Juan Triumphant. And she knows it's him. She is never going to get away from him. This film is Awesome. I'm sorry, but yes, it is not a direct thing. You know, if you want the direct thing, you can always, you know, check out the musical version, which which I I enjoy it. I like the musical version. Uh, personally, I like watching the stage version. Uh, that they that they have out on DVD. It's pretty good. It was uh, the anniversary edition. Uh, they had a really good uh, Phantom in that one. You know. Also, as I said, I absolutely love the sequel uh, musical "Love Never Dies." That is such. What a wonderful piece. I mean, I get emotional watching that uh, one. If you ever get a chance, definitely check it out. Uh, as I said, there's a whole bunch of different adaptations of Phantom of the Opera. Some good, some bad. You know, some wacky... You know, Phantom of the Paradise is an interesting take on Phantom of the Opera. Uh, don't uh, really uh, think that uh, Dario Argento's uh, one, that one is a little bit weird, but also his Dracula is also really fucked up, too. Uh Anyways, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, this, this film is just wonderful. It's 
got that, uh, you know, late 80s feel to it, as well as, you know, combine. it's a nice hybrid of the ideals of the 80s slasher uh, period, plus uh, a good dose of that uh, feel like uh, the Hammer Horror once it's a good meshing it's a wonderful film um uh, anyways so you know another little piece of history on this um uh, originally uh i was we there was going to be a show on this uh film uh for full spectrum horror uh, it was a show that we were actually working on when I finally canceled uh, the sh the podcast. You know, thing was that Mr. Highland, he had decided that he wanted to do that. I was all excited about it until he started, uh, you know, you know, telling me that, oh, no, I don't want you to talk about the other versions of Phantom of the Opera. I don't want you to talk about the book. You know, I don't, you know, I don't want this. I don't want that. And he had decided that he was going to have a guest on the show to talk about this, this movie. Uh, the guest was Bill Obert Jr., Oberst uh, Jr., the actor, you know, when, when he brought that up, it was like, okay, what does Bill have to do with Phantom of the Opera? You know, was he, was he in this version? Was he an actor in it or what? You know, what, how, how, how is he involved? Oh, well, he, he just wants to talk about it. Great. So you're going to let Bill Oberst Jr. talk about the film, but you're going to put restrictions on me. Yeah. So basically, people, you're getting the idea of why there is no full spectrum horror now is because I got really tired of this. You know, especially, you know, that that kind of set him up for the kill uh when he's sitting there telling me that he doesn't want you know he wants to restrict me on talking about phantom of the opera you don't do that to me that is uh that is an offense to me no you don't you don't do that so anyways, yeah, so it, you know, unfortunately, I had to hold back and not discuss this movie until later on. And I figured, okay, well, you know, season two, you know, my next season two uh, premiere would be fine. You know, I've, I've done five other uh, movies before this and uh, that. So, yeah, you know, can't, he can't get pissed because it's not like I've popped him in the nose over it. But, uh, yeah, I've been, I've been waiting for, you know, seven months I, I would say seven months, something like that, uh, to actually get a chance to talk about this film. So anyways, yeah, so, you know. All righty, and uh, so now it is time for our mid-show music break. And in honor of Phantom of the Opera... I have decided to play two of my favorite uh, 
music pieces from Love Never Dies, as well as uh, a version of Don Juan Triumphant from this film. So I hope you guys enjoy that. Uh, when we come back, I'll be doing, uh, of course, uh, you know, um, horror merchandise news, uh, Shout Factory, and of course, uh, movie reviews. So be ready for that. Uh, anyway, so let's check out some of these songs. I hope you enjoy them. Catch you in a little bit. No more than halfway 
never yearn to go past the world you think you know been enthralled to the call of the beauty underneath have you let it draw you in past the place where dreams begin felt the full breathless pull of the beauty underneath when the dark unfolds its wings do you sense the strangest things things no one would ever guess Things mere words cannot express. Yes. Do you find yourself beguiled by the dangerous and wild? Do you feed on the need for the beauty underneath? Have you felt your senses surge and surrendered to the urge and been hooked as you looked at the beauty underneath? When you stare behind the night, can you? its primal might might you hunger to possess hunger that you can't repress yes it seems so beautiful so strange yet beautiful everything's just as you say and he so beautiful perhaps too beautiful what I suspect cannot be and yet somehow we both see the very same way Sings. Don't you feel amazing things? Things you know you can't confess. Things you thirst for nonetheless. It's all so beautiful. Can it be? Almost too beautiful. Do you see?
I'm Charles Gaines. When I found out that XO Communications had customer service agents available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, well, naturally, I felt we should too. Thank you for calling Megatelco. This is Balcazar, Prince of Misery and Apprentice to Evil. May I help you? It's all about serving you better. They can't. We do. Voice, data, and web for business. Excel, not just talk. Hello, my sheep devils and demons. This is Nurse Hatchet, she-wolf of the wolf pack. Alrighty, so that was our music break. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, as I said, uh, if you want to... Uh, look around, uh, they have, uh, you know, recordings of, uh, the Phantom of the Opera musical, uh, they have it, uh, 60th anniversary, I think that's, a, anyways, it's an anniversary edition at Albert Hall. And just a beautiful production. Uh, also, I recommend uh, Love Never Dies, of course. You know, I've said it half a dozen times. I absolutely love that. Um, and there's just a lot of other uh, musicals in that, you know, theater productions that you can actually find... Uh, uh, filmed versions of that you can uh, go out and enjoy and it won't cost you uh, a couple hundred dollars to go see. You know, I don't, uh, you know, I've, I go to some of the local productions, uh, you know, to see musicals and that. It's still expensive. It'll cost me about 50 bucks to go see some of these. But, you know, I really enjoy it. I, I like being, you know, in the audience and seeing stuff. You know, the, the recorded versions are just as good. So definitely check those out. All righty. So anyways, enough of the Phantom... And now on to the things that you absolutely love because I do this show for you, the horror fans. And so now it is time for our horror merchandise uh, news. I know you're excited. Okay, so anyways... Uh, our friends over at Broke Horror Fan presents Terrifier and Terrifier 2 on a limited edition, fully functional VHS. Isn't that VHS? Their latest tape are on sale now. At uh, Whittier Entertainment, along with an official Damon Leone tribute shirt. Terrifier is available in a black clamshell case with artwork by, by Vensilis Zikos and a book style. Big box featuring Zikos's artwork with a flip open cover and an orange VHS limited to 250. A small quantity of the previous sold out variants is also available. It includes a letter from writer-director Damon Leon, an exclusive introduction by actor David Howard Thornton, behind-the-scenes footage, 
and Art the Clown makeup time lapse. Terrifier 2 will be available in a black clamshell case with artwork by Creepy Duck Design, a big box with artwork by Sam Cohen, and an orange VHS limited to 100 in Art Crispy's book style big box with a flip open cover and a red VHS limited to 250. It includes exclusive introductions by writer, director Damon Leon, actors David Howard Thornton, uh, Lauren Laverna, and Elliot Fulliam for... Optimal VHS viewing, the films have been cropped from their original aspect ratio. Uh, both films are officially licensed and have been approved by Lyon. Good. Next we have... It follows original motion picture soundtrack track has been available on vinyl via Milan Records since 2015, but Newberry Comics is carrying a new in exclusive color variant limited to 1,000 copies. The album is pressed on clear vinyl with black and white splatter for $25.99. The score is composed by Disaster Peace, who did Triple Frontier and Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. Ugh. The menu will be released on digital on January 3rd, followed by Blu-ray and DVD on January 17th via Searchlight Pictures, the 2022 dark comedy horror thriller is directed by Mark Mylud, uh Ali... G, uh, in the house and succession. I guess those are the films that he had done. Cool. Anya Taylor Joy, House Ray Fines, Hong Chow, Janet McTeer, Judith Light, and John Leguizamo star. Seth uh, Reese, Late Night with Seth Meyers and Will Tracy, Late Night with John Oliver, wrote the script. Special features are listed below. Special features. Open Kitchen, a look inside the menu. Three-part making featurette with director Mark Malloy, cast and crew, three deleted scenes. A young couple travels to a coastal island to eat at an exclusive restaurant where the chef has prepared a lavish menu with some shocking surprises. Saw that saw that movie. Fantastic. I highly recommend it. NECA is adding three more characters to its body knockers line in July 2023. 
Elvira, Frankenstein, and Coraline each stand 6.5 tall, priced at $13.99. They rock from side to side when exposed to light. Exorcist Star and Annabelle were announced earlier this month for release in May. Terror Threads has released a Terrifier 2 collection featuring four t-shirts designed by Sam Coyle and Tito Six for $35. Art the Clown and Selena Enamel Pins designed by Dark Cult for $14 and sweatpants designed by Toto Six, $45. Apparel will ship by January 31st while the enamel pins are due on February 17th. Project Wolf Hunting will be released on Blu-ray, DVD, and digital on February 14th via WellGo USA, the 2022 South Korean uh, sci-fi horror action thriller will stream on Screenbox and Haya on May 15th. Also known as Nungbe well, whatever. Uh, anyways, the hyper violent film is written and directed by Kim Hung Sung, The Chase, Seo Nagung, Chang Dung Yung, Choyo Gai Hong, Sung Dai Zhang. Park Hung San and Chung So Min Star. Both the original Korean audio and a new English dub are included. Special features behind the scenes featurette, making of the alpha featurette. While under heavily armed guard, the Dangerous convicts aboard a cargo ship unite in a coordinated escape attempt that soon escalates into a bloody all-out riot. But as the fugitives continue their beautiful, uh, brutal campaign of terror, they soon discover that not even the most vicious among them is safe from the horror they unknowingly released from the darkness below deck. Ooh, sounds sounds like my cup of tea, definitely. Horror Decor has released four vinyl banners with vintage sideshow-inspired designs by... Bernzig, based on Hellraiser, The Shining, and A Nightmare on Elm Street and Child's Play. Priced at $40, they measure 24 by 30 with metal grommets on each corner. I've seen these. They look fantastic. They look like, uh, like um, you know, the Circus Sideshow posters. Fantastic. Jim will paint uh, it created stained glass style Terminator 2 Judgment Day art using MS Paint. It's available on AC thrut size prints for uh, $40. AC, let's see. 
hold on. Things being too. Okay. Uh, A2 size prints for 46. <coughs> A1 size prints for $67. And t shirts. For $29. Entertainment Earth is exclusively carrying Godzilla and Mothra backlight Funko Pop figures. Shipping in March. They're available for pre-order for $13. And that's it for the... Uh, Horror merchandise. Uh, next will be uh, Shout Factory releases. I know you're all excited about those. <coughs> <coughs> Alrighty, first one is Ouija for $39.99. Synopses. How far would you go to make contact with someone you lost? From the producers of Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Insidious comes a supernatural thriller in which a group of friends must confront their most terrifying fears when they unwittingly release a dark power from the other side. What started as a game will unleash an evil only they can stop. Olivia Cook from Ready Player One, Douglas Smith from Bye Bye Man, Brit uh, Bianca Santos from The Duff, and Darren uh, Sagaroff from The Secret Life of the American Teenager star in this relentless, chilling ghost story. All right. Bonus features. Disc 1. 4K UHD. In Dolby Vision, HD 10 compatible. New audio commentary with co-writer, director, Styles White. Audio commentary with uh, producer Brad F Fuller. Audio DTS HD Master Audio 5.1 DTS HD Master Audio 2 Disc 2 Blu-ray. Pretty much the same thing. Uh, Spirit Board in Evolution. Icon of the Unknown. Adapting the Fear. Theatrical trailers for uh, Ouija and... Ouija Origin of Evil, Audio DTS, you know. So, anyways, yeah, that's uh, Ouija. Next one for thirty-one ninety-nine. They Live, limited edition steel box with exclusive poster. Yes, indeed. Synopses, they influence our decisions without us knowing it. They numb our senses without us feeling it. They control our lives without us realizing it. They live. Horror master John Carpenter, Halloween the Thing, directs this heart-pounding thriller in which aliens are systematically gaining control of the Earth by 
masquerading as humans and lulling the public into submission. Humanity's last chance lies with a lone drifter who stumbles upon a harrowing discovery, a unique pair of sunglasses that reveal the terrifying and deadly truth. Bonus features. Disc 1, 4K Ultra HD. Anyways, yeah. uh, Commentary with director John Carpenter and actor Roddy Piper. Disc 2, the Blu-ray, pretty much the same stuff. Yeah. Hold on. (laughs) Then also, uh, independent thoughts, an interview with John Carpenter, Man vs. Aliens, an interview with actor Keith David, Woman of Mystery, an interview with actress Meg Foster, Watch, Look, Listen, The Sights and Sounds of They Live, a look at the visual style, stunts, and music with director of photography, Gary B. Kuba, or Kiba. Yeah, Kiba. Uh, Stunt coordinator, Jeff Amada, and co- uh, composer Alan Hayworth. Original making of the footage from commercials created for the film, theatrical trailer, TV spots, still gallery. Not bad for thirty one ninety nine. I think I think that's pretty good. Next for thirty one ninety nine. Freaky! Yes, that Bloomhouse one. A bloody body swapping blast. Drew Taylor Collider. It's the biggest game changer on the slasher scene since Scream. Michael Gingold, Rue Morgue. Hmm. Thought he was with Fangoria. Oh, well, whatever. From Bloomhouse, who does Happy Death Day, comes a terrific slasher flick with a twist. Things get freaky at Blissfield High when 17-year-old Millie swaps bodies with an infamous serial killer. Ooh. Okay. Disc one. Commentary with uh, co-writer, director, Christopher Landon. Disc two, Blu-ray. Audio commentary with Chris Landon. Deleted scenes, craft the kills. Us. Splitting personalities, Millie versus the Butcher. Final Girl reframed. Christra Landon's brand of horror. Trailers for Freaky. Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to to you. Anyway, so so that's that. Not bad for thirty one ninety nine. I. I can see that. You know, and I really love the film, so there. Okay, here we go. $35.99. Dawn of the Dead remake. Collector's edition with exclusive poster. Okay. I gather that this is the... Zack Snyder one. Okay. Bloody good fun. Ebert and Roper. 
Really? I'm surprised. Heart-pounding action and bone-chilling thrills power this edge and frightening remake of George R. A. Romero's apocalyptic horror classic. Yep. From visionary filmmaker Zack Snyder, 300. Uh, Army of the Dead, Zack Snyder's Justice League, comes a nightmarish vision where society is endangered by a mysterious virus that turns people into mindless, flesh-eating zombies. And a handful of survivors must wage a desperate last stand battle to stay alive and human. Awesome. Disc one, 4K UHD, unrated cut. 4K scans from original camera negative with inserts from the 2K digital intermediary for unrated footage. Audio commentary with director Zack Snyder and producer Eric Newman. Disc 2 Blu-ray unrated cut. Once again, same thing. Commentary with Zack Snyder and Newman. Introduction to the unrated cut with Zack Snyder. Uh, splitting headaches, anatomy of exploding heads. Attack of the Living Dead. Raising the Dead. Andy's Lost Tape. Uh, yeah. Andy's Lost Tape, uh, Special Report Zombie Invasion, Undead and Loving It, a Mockumentary, Drawing the Dead Featurette, Storyboard Comparison, Hidden Easter Egg. Disc 3, Blu-ray Theatrical Cut. Um, take a Chance on Me, an interview with actor Ty... Burrell, uh, Gun for Hire, an interview with writer James Gunn, Punk Rock Zombie, an interview with actor J J Jake we Weber, uh, Killing Time at the Mall, special effects of Dawn of the Dead, an interview with special makeup effects artists David Andrew and Heather Langenkamp Anderson. Uh, deleted scenes with optimal, optional commentary by Zack Schneider and producer Eric Newman. A theatrical trailer and still gallery. All righty. And next... For $35.98, we've got the Bubba Hotep Collector's Edition with exclusive poster. A fiendishly funny comedy horror, BBC.com. Bruce Camel, Campbell, Army of Darkness, gives his greatest and most entertaining performance to date. Premiere. As an aging and cantankerous Elvis in this zingerful crowd pleaser, the Hollywood Reporter, from the writer director John Constancelli, who wrote Phantasm, John dies at the end when mysterious deaths plague a Texas retirement ho home. It's up to its most uh, sequinine se senior citizen to take on a 3,000-year-old Egyptian mummy with a pennant for cowboy boots, uh, bathroom graffiti, and sucking the souls from the barely living. 
Awesome. All righty, and we got also uh, another another version of this. Uh, Bubba, Bubba Hotep Collector's Edition with two posters and slip cover for $39.98. And we got another one because, you know, they can't, can't have enough Bubba Hotep. Bubba Hotep Collector's Edition plus two posters, slip cover, and enamel pin set. And you're not going to believe this one, people. You are not going to believe this. This is this is outrageous. Ninety five dollars and ninety nine cents. So they add over sixty dollars for an enamel pin set for this. I mean, give me a flip and break, people. But we are not done yet. No, we are not. Boba Hotep Collector's Edition theatrical po poster autographed exclusive poster slip cover and enamel pin set for a hundred and twenty dollars and ninety nine cents. Okay, guys, uh, you got you guys are fucked in the head for this one. I mean seriously, I I know I know you guys over at Scream Factory love bundles, but this is a this is outrageous. S over $60 for for enamel pin set? Give me a break. It's all it's only four pins for Christ's sake. God damn people. All righty. Well, anyways, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I gave you an additional ramp. What, whatever. Anyways, yeah. Now it is time. I know you guys have been waiting because I know, I know you're, you know, you love movie reviews, and I got three movies for you tonight. First one. And amazingly enough, it is a woke film. Uh, the Invitation. That's right, The Invitation. You know, it's a horror thriller. Uh, after the death of her mother and having... No other known relatives. Evie takes a DNA test and discovers a long-lost uh, cousin she never knew she had. Invited by her newfound family to a lavish wedding in England... Uh, in the English countryside, she... At first, is seduced by the sexy Christ, uh, aristocrat host, but soon is thrust into a nightmare of survival as she uncovers the twisted secret of her family's history. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's interest. It's an interesting film. Uh, honestly, I can honestly say that this is a woke film that is done correctly. And if you guys don't know yet, uh, yes, it's it, it's a vampire movie. The host is Count Dracula himself. And he wants to turn Evie into his third bride. Anyways, yeah, they do a lot. Of, they do a lot of good work uh, with it. You know, they they do respect the Dracula story and that. 
The guy they got for Dracula is fantastic. I was very, uh, very impressed. Okay, so let me see. What is uh, my review? You know, what is my rating on this Oogie Boogie scale? I'll give this one a four. I was very, I was very thr thrilled by it. You know, it it actually was really good. I, you know, a lot of woke films I absolutely cannot stand, but this this was tolerable because they did a good job and made a very good uh vampire film. I was very happy with it. It kind of reminded me of Ready or Not uh, Knives Out and um, the old f uh, classic film, The Legacy. So, very good. Uh, also, a little bit of trivia for you that I found out. Uh, director Jessica M. Thompson revealed that an alternate R-rated cut of the film will be released on VOD and screaming, streaming following the theatrical run. In the other, more gory, violent, and nudity are added, which were removed from the theatrical version for a PG-13 rating. Awesome! I didn't notice uh, any lack of violence in that. I thought I thought it was really good. Alrighty, speaking of violence, yeah, you know, we just came off of Christmas, and what would Christmas be without uh, violence and and death and murder and that? Yeah, so you know, I saw. Violent Night, and just oh god, this was good. You know what? What? What screams Christmas better than uh, an unhappy Santa Claus going after mercenaries attacking the estate of a rich family? Yeah, this this one was really good. Um, you have the guy who plays the father in Stranger Things. Uh, he's Santa, and he's the real Santa. Yeah, you know, we got we got to tell you this. This is the real Santa, and he's unhappy because kids have lost the Christmas spirit. And all they want is the latest things. They don't. They don't really care about giving and stuff. You know, they don't make the naughty list, but they they're just, you know, he's he's disgruntled about it. You know, there's a scene in the in the movie where he's going to deliver presents. And what he finds under the tree is a shitload of uh, Amazon boxes, un unwrapped Amazon boxes, and it's like, fuck you, and he just throws the presents at the tree. You know, you see uh, Santa go out and get drunk, and he goes in, you know, he goes to fly off, and the head of the bar goes out to because she sees him go into the roof and he's flying off and he ends up puking on her. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, Santa kicks ass. <clears throat> I mean, he takes out these mercenaries and stuff. It's great because this one little girl, she's the, uh, she's, uh, the mulatto little girl 
of one of the, the rich family members, and he's stuck having to go go to this party for the with the family and the 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 son and his little girl you know she just wants to meet her grandma and her grandma's this uh uh snooty uh uh you know industrialist and stuff but anyway, she gets stu- the little girl gets stuck, and she uh, finds, you know, Santa finds out that she's there, and he has to save her, you know, because she's on the good list, and she still believes in the miracle of of Christmas and that. So he he ends up fighting fighting with these mercenaries and and robbers and stuff, and. He kicks ass. It's great. I love it. <laughs> Santa kicking ass. I love that movie. So on the Oogie Boogie scale, I give this one a five. Seriously, I give Violent Night a five. Awesome movie. Fantastic. I highly recommend it. People. My last piece is uh, my last review is uh, one on a fan film, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, fan films have been doing really good. I mean, you know, some some series have. You know, some franchises, their fan films are actually better than the films that are coming out uh, on the big screen in that. Uh, The one that I'm talking about is a prequel to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it's called The Sawyer Massacre. Yeah, it take, this one takes place in 1965. And, you know, you know that, uh, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre took place in 1979. So it's, it's a number of years away from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anyways, Jimmy's friends... Bring him to the Texas countryside to escape the city life after a terrible tragedy, which I don't know what it is. I guess his girlfriend uh, died or something. They didn't really go into it, which is pretty bad from a writing point of view. Anyways, Anita supplies for the cabin. They ascend to upon a nearby gas station. Of course, you know which gas station uh, they're getting upon. (laughs) They are directed to find their supplies at an isolated farmhouse. You know the farmhouse very well. But this property is not as it seems. Fuck right. They soon find themselves hunted by a cannibalistic psychopath with a chainsaw. Yeah, Leatherface. Anyways, yeah, they bring they bring the classic characters in there. The Leatherface is actually halfway decent except for the fact that his mask makes him look like the Hulk. Um yeah, they got the classic characters, and Grandpa even talks in this. I guess he's a a lot younger, a bit younger than he was uh, in the other movies. But anyways, um, and they introduce a new chubby uh, brother to Leatherface. Uh, his name's Rex. Uh... One thing I can say for this, 
is that they did some very good special effects for the budget. Uh, they captured somewhat the feel of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. They brought in some of the grittiness uh, from the original film, which, you know, it was done on a low budget. Uh, this film was also done on a very low budget. You know, it was crowdfunded and stuff. Um, the only, you know, besides some of the writing, you know, some of the writing is a little bit uh, off for me. Uh, also, the... Uh, the pace of the film is off. You know, they it needed a little bit more editing. Uh, it needed actually to have a capable editor <coughs> because the editing just didn't didn't work to too well for me. Uh, acting was unprofessional. Um, they did have one good actress. Uh, she was a black lady, but the way that they wrote her, she was stupid. Uh, there's just some stupid scenes in this thing that I couldn't believe they actually did. I mean, they got the this one scene where the one guy comes in to the house and he goes all the way through the house. He finds the door down to uh, Leatherface's uh, workshop and he actually opens the door Stink, you know, the stink comes up from all the meat and all that. And believe it or not, people, this guy actually goes walking down into the basement area. What the fuck? And he's sitting there, hello, hello, walking down. Oh, my fucking God. And then the black lady does exactly the same thing. And it's like, what the fuck? You know, it's, it's, yeah, I know it's a trope that, that people do stupid things in this movie, but excuse me, you know, oh my God, that's right, that's right up there is, oh, you know, sh you know, should we grab the uh, car that's on that's, you know, sitting out here, or should we go and run into the workshop behind the wall of uh, uh, chainsaws to hide? And oh, let's 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 go out into the into the graveyard rather than running down the street, you know, down the road. Uh, yeah. Oh. Uh, God, give me a fucking break. That that's some of the stuff that just irritates me when these ones do these idiocies. I'm sorry, yeah, it's a movie. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, William, it's a movie. You know, there's supposed to do stupid stuff like uh, oh fuck you I can write an intelligent slasher film and I don't have stupid shit like that and it turns out good people love it that just that just annoyed me so anyways you know let's finish this off uh, I give the Sawyer Massacre, I'll give it a three. It was okay. It, you know, for what it was, it was okay. They did put a lot of work into this. It did look halfway decent. So, you know, it, 
you know, from from a production point of view, it looked pretty damn good. So, yeah, I'll I'll give it uh, an okay. Alrighty, so anyways, that's that's it for our season premiere. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I I do this for you guys. Uh, anyways, uh, remember, if you like what we do, check us out on locals.com. You know, we're, we're trying to start a new community over there. The Wolfpack is. Uh, Wolfpack Presents. And you can you can see uh, you know earlier episodes of Bloodbath Beyond. You can see earlier episodes of Bloodbath Theater. All kinds of different stuff on there. I've so far put up a hundred and seventy six videos on locals that you can enjoy. I'll probably be putting in some exclusive. Uh, material as well so check it out on locals Alrighty. so anyways you know that's it uh as always remember i do this show for you and as always keep america strong watch horror films i'll catch you later
<laughs> Phoenix Comics and Toys. <laughs> Hello, creeps. Get your one of a kind custom horror host figurines. That's right, kiddies. Oh, you can find hosts like the Keymaster, Mummy and the Monkey. I just love that name. <laughs> Mr. Lobo, or even. Carlos Borloff's Monster Madhouse. <laughs> Tell him your bony little friend, the Crypt Keeper, sent you. <laughs> it won't get you a discount, but it might get you killed. <laughs> Phoenix Comics and Toys. It's Spooky Boo from Spooky Boo Scary Storytime. Grab a glass of wine, a nice warm blanket, and a pair of headphones and listen to the spooky tales of the internet. Some of the stories I write, some are creepypasta, others are sent in by listeners. You'll enjoy falling asleep to these spooky, scary stories. Now get ready, and I'll see you in your nightmare. Ah! <laughs> 